Hello and welcome. My name is Carol Carter and I'm the founder and CEO of Global Minded. At Global Minded, we are dedicated to creating a capable, diverse talent pipeline to get more women, people of color, underrepresented, any way that you can define diversity into the education, employment, economic mobility, and leadership pipeline. So we do that in a number of ways. We have an annual conference every year, and uh, this year it will be virtual, and it's called uh, uh, Reboot Resilience, colon, Rebound Remarkable. And all of the sessions are about how we can come out of the last year and the challenges that we faced in a way where we are so much stronger and so much more able to make a difference in our world for the things that matter. There will be students on every single panel and um, we hope that you will join us. We'll launch with Earth Week and we'll be going for 10 weeks through the middle of June. And today we are here with our Foundations and Funders Equity Panel. We have um, six of these every month from higher ed, K-12, uh, technology, STEM, and uh, health is one of them as well. And today, foundations and funders to look at how can we make the world more equitable through the way in which money is deployed for causes, for closing the equity gap, for the people who are really on the front lines, um, especially during COVID. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you all today, Dr. Karen McNeil Miller. She is the CEO of the Colorado Health Foundation. And she describes herself as a social and human impact leader. And that is at the center of her life's work. She helps guide the foundation to, to determine the most impactful investment of human financial and influence capital on behalf of Coloradans who need it most. Also, her, her methods have set the standard for a lot of other people in other states who have learned, especially during this time and benefited from her work. She says, I choose this important field of work to be on the ground in Colorado communities and to get closer to those in need, many through no fault of their own and assist in every way that I can. Previously, Karen served for decades as president of the Kate B. Reynolds Charitable Trust. Karen is also the 2019 recipient of the Global Minded Inclusive Leader Awards in the Foundations and Funders category, yes. So Karen, welcome and just so wonderful to be here. We are celebrating um, women. This is our last day of March, but we have had a celebration every day for International Month of Women and Women's History. And, um, and Karen is the perfect person to lead these incredible women today. So welcome Karen and everyone. Thank you, Carol. You know, I have yet to find anyone who likes hearing me introduced other than my mother. So when she watches this, she'll be very, she'll be very happy to hear that introduction. So uh, I'm so happy to see th those of you that have joined us today and hope that you will be a part of our conversation by putting any uh, remarks or comments or questions you have in chat. I'll try to keep a watch on that we go through and, and integrate those into the conversation. And as Carol said, we are celebrating the last day of International Women's Month and Women's History Month. And at least also here in the United States, we're also today celebrating a particular man and that man is Cesar Chavez. And so I want to also talk about Cesar Chavez Day and he was someone who is considered one of the fathers and founders of the labor movement for agricultural workers. And particularly in certainly Colorado, and I think across the country, we still have most of our agricultural workers are uh, of Latinx origin. And so we celebrate uh, him and his work and, that, and the need for that cause today as well. But now we're gonna talk about, you know, the, the follow the money and how we utilize money to bring about a more inclusive economy, a more inclusive world, how to reduce inequities and how to make it a more just society. And we've got these four incredible women who I'm gonna let introduce themselves. And in that introduction, uh, they will let us know who they are, their organization and the work that they're engaged in and why that work is so important to them. So I'm gonna start with Maya, Maya Sharpley. 
Great, thanks so much. And uh, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you, Carol, for, for setting this up. Um, my name is Maya Sharpley. I am the co-founder and managing partner of Juva Ventures. Juva Ventures is uh, an ed tech focused or uh, venture capital firm focused on early stage companies, early childhood or pre-K to gray, as we say, both domestic and international. Um, I fell into education, actually, kind of a, a quick history on myself. I fell into education, um, started working with uh, Joel Klein and Mayor Mike Bloomberg in, uh, in New York City Public Schools uh, when we were turning those around. From there, went to Kaplan, spent many years at Kaplan, uh, building and running businesses around the world, and um, first started getting my touch of entrepreneurial, so actually helping others to build businesses versus uh, building them myself and investing in them uh, through Kaplan's EdTech Accelerator with Techstars. Um, through that, I realized really the importance of um, really focusing on those innovative technologies that will change the world and the right leaders to do so. And so I slowly shifted onto what I call the dark side jokingly, which is moving from an entrepreneur building and running to actually an investor helping others build and run. And that's what we do at Juvo. We support, we aid, we uplift those who believe that education is a bridge to opportunity as both my partner Dre and I do. And that's what we look for. We think it's so important that bridge that opens doors, levels playing fields, provides equity and access. So I'm excited to be here to um, share in the conversation today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maya. Isabel, Isabel Howe, introduce yourself, please. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you, Carol, for the invitation. Thank you for your leadership at the Global Minded and all you do, uh, especially this month, but throughout the years. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to be a, one of your um, friends for, for now so many years. So I, I was recently a founding partner of Imaginable Futures, uh, which is the education venture of the Omidyar Group. Uh, the Omidia Group being the philanthropic investment firm of Pierre and Pam Omidia, Pierre being the founder of eBay, where I started um, the US education practice. And I focused on, um, on education in two of the most overlooked, uh, yet the most impactful um, areas of education, the start of life, uh, the early years, uh, as well as the adult learning years. And I am now taking a, um, a little bit of a book from investing, uh, writing some of my learnings uh, and trying to reach um, minds and hearts in a different way through, uh, through writing on some of those topics that I still continue to believe are critically important, the early years and the adult years. Thank you, Isabel. Gloria. Gloria Schock. Sure. Um, thank you, Karen and Carol, for this opportunity to be with all of you in sisterhood today. Um, I'm delighted in, in conversation with such an extraordinary group of inspiring leaders who are a force for good in the world every day. Um, so I am the executive director of the VF Foundation and director of Global Impact. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with VF, um, VF is a global leader in outdoor apparel and shoe wear. That's headquartered in Denver, Colorado. Um, you may be familiar with some of our brands, including the North Face, Timberland, Vans, Smart Wool, Dickies. And the foundation is the corporate philanthropic grant making arm of VF that's committed to being a catalyst for positive and meaningful change in the communities where VF's employees live and work and where VF and its brands operate around the world for the betterment of people and planet. So, we strive to be part of the solution to address some of the greatest social and environmental issues that face our business and the communities that we serve with an equity lens and approach to all of our work. And that includes combating climate change, um, championing environmental justice, to break down barriers, to create a more inclusive and, and equitable um, access to the outdoors and, in, and really to create inviting green spaces so everyone can enjoy the power and health benefits of close to home access to nature um, and to feel safe and free to explore and move and, and to be moved by the outdoors. Um, we're also passionate about unlocking educational opportunities for all so that everyone can achieve their full potential. And this includes empowering women, which makes up a significant part of our global value chain. 
um, for apparel companies like VF. 85% um, of our workers who make our products every day are women. And um, so they come top of mind in so much of the philanthropy work that we're doing in the communities where VF operates. Thank you, Gloria. And Janet. Janet Hall. Thank you, Karen. And uh, Carol, thank you again for having me. It's always uh, a wonderful, wonderful uh, feeling to be back here um, with you and now meeting everyone. Um, my name is Janet Salazar. I am the president and executive chairman of the Foundation for the Support of the United Nations. We're one of the uh, major uh, um, large NGOs uh, accredited with the United Nations through the Economic and Social Council. Um, we were founded in 1988, so we're like going to be 30, 33 years now. So um, yeah, credit to the founding fathers, I call them. We're the new generation now continuing this legacy. But our work at the Foundation for the Support of the United Nations is focused on not only bringing the private sector insights and perspective inside the United Nations, you know, through our global events, such as the power of collaboration and uh, uh, the annual convergence um, during the General Assembly, but most importantly, um, on the side, we do a lot of public-private partnership um, uh, forums and 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 uh, conversations that results in tangible, um, you know, partnerships where capital deployment is the main goal, specifically to support the sustainable development goals. And also out of this, we have created four funds. And in the context of today's equity and funding discussion, of course, I am happy to say that we have two funds focused on this, which is the FSG1 Fund for Women and the FSG1 Fund for Education. Um, so uh, we are in, in a few countries around the world and continue to, to expand. We are now focused in um, a lot of opportunities for partnership in China, again, to address um, a lot of inequities, um, you know, but specifically channeling funding from investors, there's and partners. And then also right now we are actively um, expanding in Africa. Um, through Nairobi in Kenya. So I'm very excited about this. And uh, we have built a lot of partnerships, mostly at the national level. Our infrastructure is global and, and the, way we, the way our system works is uh, national government partnerships. And they're the ones then who connects us with NGOs and private partners on the ground that are vetted. And then that's when, you know, when we start talking about capital and funding deployment, that's, it's, it's pretty much almost like a private foundation um that we do um yeah and and um i'm happy to continue to be doing this work and just be able to um contribute to to the entire uh, inequity um that we are all aware of and what we're trying to to address in our in our capacities here and our our, our platforms and our our businesses thank you for having me again thank you janet you know ladies you know, Janet, when I was looking up the, the UN Foundation and I see that the, just the UN goals, the, the 17 global goals for sustainable development from the UN, I'm going to take the time to read them. And I'd like each of you to kind of keep count of how many of these you are actually, also, you're focused on in your work. Right? So there's no poverty, no hunger, good health quality education, gender equality, clean air and sanitation, renewable energy, good jobs and economic growth, innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption, climate action, life below water, which I love, life on land, peace and justice, and partnerships for the goals. So how it's, I think when I looked at that, I was like, we're all working towards the 17 development. So could each of you just kind of talk about where, how many intersections did you see and but like, what's the scale? Um, what's the scope and scale of, of your work? For instance, in Colorado, the Colorado Health Foundation, our 
focus is on the state of Colorado. So if we could bring equitable solutions to scale in Colorado, we will certainly have met our mission, yet we also would love to see um, successful solutions adopted across the United States. But our, our real focus of our scale is Colorado. So what intersection, how many intersections did you, did you notice? And then what's the, what's the geography of your scale? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. So I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so I noticed, I, I actually had a hard time. I had to keep two lists because I found that there were six that we directly focus on, obviously quality education, jobs, things like that. But you know, our, our true belief is that without education, a lot of these other things won't exist. So increasing, reducing poverty, increasing affluence, all that's all tied to a good education. So I think there's that secondary effect that that you know is created as well. Exactly. We and we like to say we think everybody's in the health business because every every decision has some kind of health impact down the yeah. road. Absolutely. Education, housing. Um, law enforcement, there's a health impact on all of those things. Yeah. And, you know, we look at the globally, so we're investing globally. So um, the world is our oyster. Okay. I can, yeah, I can say too, you know, first and foremost, I think for BF, I mean, we touch so many of those commitments um, around the world. And I think ultimately for us, it's about creating more of an equitable and sustainable world for all, which touched so many components of the UN sustainable goals. Um, and this investment, I'd say from a woman's empowerment perspective is really a deep commitment to fundamental human rights and, and women's equality by advancing health rights, um, well-being, um, both inside and outside our company walls. And ultimately, you know, we, we know that we can't do this work alone. It does take critical partnerships and valuable partnerships. And so we've been partnering with NGOs that are women-led, women-serving local organizations to provide educational resources to really shift cultural norms that negatively impact women, um, such as gender-based violence, which we know has been on the rise around the world given the pandemic, and educating women on both, you know, just key health issues that they face every day and providing financial empowerment resources um, and opportunities to lift them out of poverty and to open doors of economic opportunity. I'd, I'd say with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, when I look across just all of our work, um, I'd say it probably touches around like eight of, of the commitments, um, working towards clean water and sanitation, which we know is so important and where there's a need for more access, particularly in the developing world. Um, and then also just working on decent work and economic growth, climate action, and um, bringing nature to cities, which I think is ultimately an environmental justice topic as well. Um, there's so much power in creating more close to home access to green space and nature that um, has so many benefits, I think, from an environmental standpoint as well in terms of reducing heat islands, for instance, um, which um, has become a growing issue around the world and, and here in the US as well. Um, and we're just excited to continue to, to work with incredible partners like, like yourselves to continue to advance this important work on a local and global scale. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we knew this before COVID, but COVID I think has um, highlighted uh, for all of us, not only our global interdependence, um, but also these intersectionalities in everyone's lives. Um, uh, clearly, uh, in my work um, in the early years, health and education are very, very overlapping. We call it early childhood development for a reason. Uh, it's um, it, it is so much overlap between the learning piece and the health piece. Uh, I mean, poverty is... Um, you know, just I could go on for, for a long time on its on its impact on um, on young children, parents, um, and um, and education more broadly, and all my work. Um, um, so these these intersectionalities matter so much. One that is not on this list for um, that um, uh, would be maybe nice to reflect on is structural racism. Um, um, 
which obviously also is um, uh, you know impacting so much of uh, of uh, of the work that um, that I've done and that I do. Thank you, Isabel. Janet, we know you're you intersect on all seventeen of these, but and we know you, <laughs> yeah. we know you have a global. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. It was just, yeah, thank you, uh, Karen. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, this, yeah, I just, I was just happy that everybody touched on, on, on all the 17 and, you know, to, to cap it all, definitely is the 17th, which is partnerships for the goals, right? That's why we're all here. And that is the strong, the, the strongest uh, one that, you know, as, 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 a, as a FSU one, we do. Uh, very much, and that's what we bring actually, you know, inside the United Nations and 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 around the globe to our partners. So yeah, we pretty much touch almost everything, uh, specifically when it comes to economic development and uh, employment and stuff. So we do a lot of capital deployment, etc. So yeah, I'm curious if you all experience the same thing that I do. That when you want to enter a conversation about inequities and the role that racism or sexism have played in the perpetuating, in the presence and perpetuating um, of those inequities, that the conversation will quickly devolve because people want to take it at a personal level. I'm not a racist. I'm not a sexist. But where I'm talking and want to have the conversation is at the structural and systemic level. So do you experience that as well? And how do you get people to, to talk about and understand the structural and systemic racism and sexism that has led to so many of the inequities that we are all um, addressing. Um, can I? Sure, please do. Uh, yeah, so uh, this, is, this is really important for me, such a, a really um, critical question, Karen, because I think on a personal level and you know, on a professional level, it, 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 at the core of what I do is leadership um, you know, leadership development, leadership awareness, all that, you know, all, all that shift has to come from, from that, you know, from that level. There's a saying they say, you know, the fish rots from the head. So, <laughs> I mean, if we don't, if we really don't do anything about that head up there, you know, it's, 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 it, nothing's gonna, gonna change. And I mean, we recognize the importance of also bottom to top approach, right? You know, it's very important and then top to bottom and they meet in the middle, but really, you know, at the core of, of this all and, and, and pretty much a substantial part of what we do and what I do personally, even with my business, is the influencing, you know, um, the leaders, you know, the decision makers, pretty much, you know, and seeing everything on that scale. I mean, when we don't want to use this, the term macro, but it, it 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 has to be like that from from where we are. I mean, you know, it's like it, it's it, it's like what they say, you know, we go big or we go home. We we have to address this as a systemic uh, issue, you know. It's a big elephant. It's it's a big big elephant. This inequity across across the across the board, and it has to to start. There a shift in the mindset of the top level uh, decision makers. So yeah, that's that's my take on that. And Janet, how how is your message received? It, it's. Um, with my experience, of course, there's a lot of uh, old fashioned resistance, you know, it's still, it's still, especially in the governmental level, like in Africa, for example, this is very prevalent in Africa where the average decision maker is 62 years old, 62 years old, whether that is in the government or the business, 62 years old is the average, you know, decision maker. So that's sort of like a no, no. And so with that comes a lot of baggage in terms of archaic policies, you know, archaic like, like beliefs and systems that are so hard to break. Right. And so, yes, many times, you know, right now I've experienced just in, a, in, in this first quarter of the year where we're actively really expanding in Africa and in my conversations with a lot of these ministers, a lot of these even business leaders whom I, I, I thought would be, you know, much, much easier and more accepting of, of what we have to propose in terms of helping the youth with, because right now there's a crisis in Africa. The entire continent has a crisis in terms of youth. You know, there's, there's this just lack of employment and the entire younger generation are so desperate. 
So we're trying to come in and address that issue. And Carol, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to talk to you more about this later because I know that you know, the younger generation is a core of what you do. But going back to what I said, you know, it really is a lot of, a lot of systemic, archaic, issues and beliefs and even policies in the government that needs to be crushed and changed and shifted. You know, so those are kinds of like, on a personal level, like face to face when I talk on the phone to them, this is what I experience, you know, but I think it takes time and patience, you know, and a lot of awareness and education that, you know, we, we, we gotta, you know, when we gotta do our best to, to make these things cr just crumble and shatter and, and change the entire thing, so. Great. I'll come back in a few moments and we'll talk about like what disruption has to happen and what policies have to change. But first, let me get some more comments on uh, the, the particular question. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with you that there's a huge structural issue here and having been on the inside of a large of a large government agency um, and now being on the outside. Um, I completely agree. Where we focus and where we try to address that, that change is by investing in entrepreneurs that are creating new structures, right? Who are saying, okay, I'm not going to stick within the given structure. I'm going to create something new. So whether that's a company like OnRamp um, out of Oakland that's focused on uh, providing an on-ramp or a pathway for diverse hires into your top firms in Silicon Valley and around the world, or that's a company like New Campus in Singapore that is looking at um, small business owners, right? Who often don't ha haven't gone on to education, but need all the business skill skills that you learn in school and B school, and providing them those skills so they can grow and scale their own businesses, support their families, right, and raise the next generation. So we're looking for those entrepreneurs who can create new structures and bring them to scale, bring them to market at scale. And you know, in that way, shift shift the conversation. It doesn't take away from the structural elements that you were speaking of, Janet, because absolutely those exist and they're key. But how do we also build new structures on the outside that people can use to climb up that ladder or move across that bridge from education to opportunity? And so those are the types of things that we think about um, and try to, to support on a global scale. It's so important. Excellent. Anyone else wanna comment on that? Yeah, maybe uh, just one additional point, um, uh, just data. Uh, not always, you know, candidly effective everywhere, but um, um, trying to decompose the um, social economic impact from the racial impact, uh, certainly in, in the work that I do in education is helpful when you show this separately and show the gaps and the uh, and can start saying, okay, but this is not only the social economic impact, it's also the structural uh, racism element that causes some of those inequities and those gaps um, and the systems that we have. Um, I was just looking uh, at some data on prenatal, um, uh, on the prenatal years and, uh, I mean, this, this is, you know, the way um, doctors look at, um, uh, at the same level of pain of a woman who is giving birth and the treatment that she gets depends on the color of your skin. So it's a, you know, when you look at some of those things and just look at the data behind them, is quite telling around not only some of the inequities are socioeconomic based, which I think a lot of us understand, but that they are also anchored in uh, some of our biases. I think that's less understood and accepted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, for, regardless of how it happens, whether it's, uh, as Janet was talking about from in which was mostly inside an organization, top down, or Maya, you're talking about change that can come from outside. What do you think some of the you know, specific policies, practice, and perspectives that need to change to disrupt um, uh, the, some of the, the current racial and gender biases? And then what would we replace them with? So what, if we can tear them down, then what would we replace them with as well? 
Karen, I'm going to jump in. Okay. <laughs> just very briefly. Well, because we, we just celebrated Equal Pay mm -hmm. Day, right? Or celebrated, no, I don't want to call it a celebration, although we've gone a little bit of uh, a good way, but lots more to do. But we, you know, just a few days ago, we talked about Equal Pay Day. And so I think when it comes to um, inequity, you know, in, 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 in women's um, uh, participation, women's uh, economic um, uh, situation, you know, this, um, this really has to, there's a lot of, of policies here that needs to change. It's just really, if, if, you know, if I will compare it, it's like an asbestos ceiling. You know, it's like not a glass ceiling. I call it an asbestos ceiling because it's really toxic. It is very toxic. I'm <laughs> sorry. You know, and I love that. I'm gonna steal that officially. I'll just let you know that now. <laughs> it's, I think that's why we sometimes have little bumps on our face, right? We got too close, and <laughs> like we're we're all of a sudden like yeah, we're breaking out. I get it. <laughs> yeah, it's so toxic, and that needs to change. Really, that really needs to change inside out, left, right, top, bottom. You know, however, it has to change. It just has to change. And in the global, I mean, in the international um, level, for example, there's only, so far, there's only one organization that's doing a lot of advocacy and awareness on this, and they're called the Equal Pay International Coalition, or EPIC, EPIC. Um, you can look that up, but we support this organization because it really addresses a lot of that systemic um, biases, you know, in place when it comes to women's equal pay global level, national level, down to the regional level. And both are with the private sector and the public sector with the cooperation of the government. Um, Isabel France, by the way, is one of the, the signatories for this EPIC you know, organization. So I I'm just wanted to <laughs> let you know that. But um, we're very supportive of this platform because really, like I said earlier, you know, there's, there's, there's no way um, to, to deny this, this, uh, this um, a critical issue on, 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 on having that, you know, uh, equal pay for women. So yeah, policies, policies are the number one, uh, change in policies is the number one um, um, uh, goal of this platform. And also there's a, a huge um, discussion on the platform as well in terms of um, um, transparency, right? You, you know, transparency audits in place. So those of us, for example, who are dealing also in the private sector and business sector, like with us having our own companies and businesses, um, I think it's very important that we, you know, in terms of transparency, that we, we, we come up with, with solutions and programs in place where we could really be, you know, talking about, okay, this is what our current situation is in our company when it comes to how much our female employees are receiving versus how much our male employees are receiving. Easier said than that, than that. I know, but you know, in an ideal world, hopefully that will materialize all of this um, as we as we all work together. So, equal pay. <laughs> Laura, you have you have a perspective on the policies and practices or perspectives that need to shift or be disrupted. Yeah, absolutely. And and to Janet's point, I mean, it can sometimes feel like we're chipping away at a boulder, but it is such important work, right? And I think we all have a responsibility to, to act and enable and influence to advance equity. And it does take, you know, work on an individual systemic and cultural level. You know, I can say, you know, as a company, the heart of all of our work starts with creating an inclusive culture of allyship where everyone feels welcome and empowered to be their true selves and providing those opportunities for allyship where we can create safe spaces to, to learn and to grow together and shift power when we're having conversations as well and just listen. Um, but I think when we're talking about policies as well, I think it's it, what gets measured gets done, right? And so for instance, we have responsibilities as, as companies and, and I can say with VF, we're taking action by currently undergoing a global pay study to uncover and resolve any equities by gender, race, and ethnicity to ensure equity in the, in the workplace. And also, you know, working with experts um, as well to help elevate women's rights across our business and the communities that we serve by uh, partnering with, for instance, Business for Social Responsibility or, or BSR to look at where the gaps are in our practices across our business and in the communities that we touch and 
align our women's empowerment standards to this work. And roadmap of actions to just keep us accountable and to keep driving greater impact um, to memorialize our commitment to the UN's women's empowerment principles as well. And I could say too, in terms of just going back to what gets measured gets done, I think in the zeitgeist of what we're facing with George Floyd's murder, um, we did quickly activate as an organization, a council to advance racial equity, reporting into our CEO and put together short and long-term strategies, right? That were, that were transparent. We put them out publicly um, to be accountable to it and to these actions to address racial justice in meaningful and authentic ways um, where we could have impact and influence as a, as a business as well. Um, particularly in the areas of racial equity, environmental justice, um, education, development, and advancement. And so I think we're continuing on that journey. It's going to take time, but I'm incredibly hopeful that I think this is very top of mind for a lot of companies right now, and that we will continue to make progress um, at chipping away at this boulder. Thank you. We have, uh, I'm going to just point out a, a comment we had from one of the, from one of the listeners who kind of challenged us about how we approach communities for, wh for whom we are not indigenous and how to understand their um, history and whether or not, whether we may think something is archaic or out of bounds, do we understand what's behind that? And so, but, so what that brought up for me is this question. You know, we all have an interest in, you know, human rights. So what that brings up to me, are human rights contextual? Are human rights negotiable? Or are human rights, do we believe, or do you believe in your work that human rights are inalienable across any context? Let, that was so, a heavy question, but I'm gonna let you think about it for a second. Go ahead, Maya, you look like you're about to say something. I was gonna say, uh, you know, in, in, um, in our business, it's, it's slightly different from Janet's <laughs> position where we are. Um, I think the key thing is that, you know, we believe that human rights are inalienable, but we need to therefore support and invest in, from a venture perspective, right? Support and invest in those entrepreneurs that also believe the same thing and are working to chip away at the inequities. Um, and so it's how do you basically put your money where your mouth is and make sure that you're not only investing, but you're supporting and you know, you're meeting with, I, what was number 17 partnerships, Janet, I think, of your, of your goals, right? How do you form those partnerships with others in the ecosystem surrounding the company so that they can achieve their, their full vision? So, you know, I, it, it takes a village, right? It's, it's, not, it's not a one person answer. I think it, it requires multiple parties working in concert together to create that, recognizing that there are many hurdles to overcome, right? It's not an easy, get it done in a day and call it, right? This is, this is a long-term long focus and you have to chip away at it uh, day by day. Um. I would yeah, second okay. this entirely. Uh, human rights are inalienable. <laughs> um, and I would also agree with everything that Maya said in terms of uh, uh, this doesn't mean that we are not, uh, that we are all born in the same circumstances and the environment in which we are uh, born and raised obviously influences so much of who we are and who we become. Um, um, but human rights are inalienable on your question. <laughs> Janet, I thought you were going to jump in. Yes, thanks, Karen. And yeah, um, I agree with both Isabel and Maya, and, and that you know, human rights are inalienable. You know, it, it doesn't have any description, any other way to sugarcoat it or unsugarcoat it. it it's just human, it is human rights. It is inalienable. You know, so yeah. I would agree in the work we do at the Colorado Health Foundation that the you know that we think of a basic human right is the right to health, and that that's an inalienable right. That it's it should be your birthright. Yes, 
exactly and to and to add to what maya discussed earlier and shared you know we it's a tough work what we do it's really a tough work, especially at a global level. Well, we really have to deal with everyone. We, we have to be sensitive to everyone's culture. We have to be sensitive to, to, to the traditions, to the procedures, to the culture. And, and, and that in itself is so tough. But like what Maya said, we try to work together as one ecosystem where we just have to always remember that we all want the same thing. And that is access to, you know, to basic stuff, uh, you know, and 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 to make sure that our rights are 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 are, are pursued and and that is not denied of us. Oh. And also the fact that we all have our specific roles to play, right? Okay. There are those of us who create platforms. There are those of us who talk to our leaders, who talk to our funders who talk to, to, to the ground workers, there's those of us who visualize better words and stuff, but we're all part of an entire ecosystem. And so the role of self-determination of a community is, is, is part of that ecosystem as well, part of what I heard you just say as well. Yeah. Uh, Isabel, I think you mentioned COVID and Janet, you mentioned COVID. And here we are over a year into it. How, how has or has COVID impacted your work? The prevalence of COVID impacted your work? I think for us, it has impacted at multiple levels, obviously. One, was the, one is the how. Um, you know, how we work as a team, how we work with our portfolio organizations, um, you know, clearly, you know, just making point very <laughs> obvious, like we are now meeting online and, uh, you know, so a lot of the how um, has changed. But maybe more interestingly in our work, I think the for whom and even the what has also evolved. Um, you know, this, uh, this, um, this has um, this point about intersectionality, for example, has um, um, really shaped how we think about um, um, what we do uh, in education, mental, like, for example, we have done a lot of more work in mental health, uh, because if a, if a child or a parent is not uh, uh, healthy mentally, then they can't learn. Um, or if they don't have enough food, they can't learn. So all, all those things are, are so intertwined that the what has changed quite a bit. It has also changed in terms of seeing for us the opportunities on advocacy. Um, uh, I remember over a year ago, we had uh, as part of our work, a goal, you know, one of those goals that we have in philanthropy where uh, success would have been 1 billion additional uh, public funding in early childhood education in the US. And since COVID, there has been 50, five, zero billion invested in early childhood education in the US. So clearly the goal was completely wrong, um, but also uh, the magnitude of the changes that we are seeing in terms of um, of uh, what COVID is bringing in terms of new ideas change is um, really, really interesting. Um, and so how can uh, philanthropy also play a role on, on advocacy has been a big change on the what. And then lastly, for whom we touch on this already, but a lot more uh, work on racial justice in addition to social economic justice. So Isabel, you and Maya both. Oh, go ahead, Maya. Yeah, I was just I was going to pick up on what Isabel said in the the fifty billion. Um, we're seeing um, you know a huge influx or huge change in the acceleration of existing trends that were already there in in education technology and education technology spending. So right, we are seeing um, an increase of you know the, the percent of digital spending. Um, prior to COVID was around a little sub 4%. 4 um, and it was expected to rise to maybe five or 6% in the next five years. That could now increase as much as 10%. 
right? And so when you see that mo needle moving on a $6 trillion global market and you see it moving to think about how, what does this mean, right? Going from 3% to 15% in retail between 2008 and 2019, witness the birth of Amazon, eBay, all sorts of, and the death of Main Street and the death of, of the big you know, stores that were there. So when you lift and shift that going from 3% where we're sitting currently to five, maybe 10% in education, it's huge, right? Um, but to make it to a micro level, so there'll, there'll be lots of changes in new innovations. But when we think about this and we think about, well, what about the kids like equity and access where we started this conversation, right? Human rights, not having one size fits all, right? That kind of increase, we need to have new tools when kids, for teachers and kids, right? Uh, and learners generally. So for example, when, when students go back to school in the fall, right, some kids, sitting at home, working from home will be two months behind, three months behind. Some kids will be more. Some kids may have accelerated, right? So in a single class, when the kids come back to class, the teacher who kind of thought, okay, here are the advanced kids, here's the middle, and there are a couple that were falling behind, that will could be completely turned around based on experience. And so within one classroom, that teacher, she'll have to navigate all sorts of different learning styles, level of attainment, the, the traditional tests that we use aren't going to be able to measure that effectively and give the teacher the tools she needs to address on an individual level, on a personalized level and bring the kids to where they are, where they need to be, or for those that are accelerated in this period, push them on and beyond. So when we think about just, you know, the macro level of, of billions of dollars moving around or trillions of dollars moving around, and then we take it down to, well, the student in the classroom and equity and access, and what if they didn't have equity? Um, we're at a sea change and we'll see trends accelerating um, that were already there. And you know, it's, it's optimistic, I'm hopeful, because we now have the tools and the technology. We also more importantly have people who before, like professors in universities or some teachers who may have said, no, no, it only has to be in person who have now spent a year plus online globally, not just in the US, globally. And so mindset has shifted. So now it's about not trying to do everything on Zoom, but having purpose-built platforms that work for learning versus you know what we had to do, which is kind of slam into a solution. So I'm I'm actually super excited um, by what COVID has has laid bare, unearthed, and therefore the possibilities now to address real real problems with innovative solutions. And Maya, even as you were describing the, the classroom when students come back in the fall, mm -hmm. all of those conditions and all of those things that the teacher would have to do with are going to be there, even if the environment was by. Yeah. And then when we layer on what we know to be human biases that play into that, then exactly. we have, then the, then the situation is even more exacerbated. So we, you know, we need to think about assessments differently, which then ties into policy and government. We need to not have the kind of one size standard assessment. We need to think about how we actually understand what has been learned, unlearned, retained, et cetera. And therefore, how do we then come back and address and make sure that we're we're providing opportunities for all students, regardless of, of, of where they, they sit. I will use that in quotes. Well, I'm glad, and I'm also happy to hear you say you were optimistic and excited about some things that are gonna happen. And in the few minutes we are gonna have left, I'd love to hear other things that you're excited about. You know, what are the, the shining, what are the promises out there that you think we can, that are, promises almost fulfilled or could be fulfilled. I can chime in here, um, Karen. Um, I think we all know that the pandem pandemic has illuminated the inequities that women and communities of color have historically faced. And, and those inequities in many cases are growing um, right now too. I think this has provided the opportunity for foundations and corporate foundations like the VF Foundation to think a little bit differently about how we're approaching our work and how we can shift our, our resources quicker and in new ways in order to meet the greatest community needs where BF operates around the world. Um, one of the ways that we're doing this is by catalyzing um, collective resources by collaborating across our industry to address women's resiliency and global value chains in partnership with the UN Foundation um, and um, experts like win-win strategies and, and business for social responsibility. And then also tapping into women's funds and other like-minded um, companies that also have the same vision around equity 
um, like the GAP Foundation, P of H Foundation, H&M Foundation, and Ralph Lauren to, to support women and girls who are most vulnerable um, to these social and economic shock, shocks that we're facing with the pandemic and really using more of kind of a shared governance approach to some of the work we're doing to support some of these women-led, women-serving grassroots organizations that are locally based and locally driven and starting the work in Southeast Asia. But I think what's great about it too is we're setting up a learning lab component to the model so that we can really understand in real time what are the challenges, where, where do we need to pivot in regards to facing some of the issues that, that um, women are, are dealing with, particularly in the developing world, um, and provide rapid response grant making. Thank you, Gloria. Other excitements and possibilities. Isabel, I know you're writing a book on the future of learning. You've got to be excited about that. What's that look like? Yeah, there are, there are many areas where I have a, a lot of hope um, and where I see um, some light out of the shadows of the crisis. Um, I mean, one clearly is in childcare and, you know, some, you know, childcare has been uh, underfunded, overlooked uh, in the US and many other areas on, on, on this planet for a long, long time. And uh, what COVID has done on the positive side, if I may take a positive uh, lens on a, on a pretty dramatic and traumatic um, um, crisis, is that it has highlighted the criticality of uh, childcare for our economy to function. And so suddenly we have um, uh, a, uh, a growth and spark of, uh, of new ideas and solutions and reimagination in, uh, in the early years, which I had not seen uh, before. Uh, so very, very positive uh, coming out of the crisis. The other, the other component that I think is really interesting is more understanding of relationships and human connections and why they matter so much to us. Um, you know, there's, a, there's so much research that has been done on uh, loneliness and uh, before COVID. Uh, certainly during COVID, it has been exacerbated. Uh, uh, but I, 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 I am hopeful that what we have lived through will result in, um, uh, in a stronger relationships, stronger, especially those that are intergenerational. Um, uh, a lot of grandparents have played a major role during the crisis, uh, taking care of children, um, stepping up with financial uh, means uh, to support families in need. And um, I feel like those intergenerational relationships are here to stay. And it's nice to see the focus of the vaccine on realizing it to be elder to our older adults in our uh, in our society as um, as a sign of um, um, you know just just very positive sign of this intergenerational uh, respect uh, for the older adults. Thank you, Isabel. Janet, what are you excited about? you mention me, Karen? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'm excited about the, the current trend of, um, there's been an organic growth of private sector, business sector, uh, holding each other accountable for more support for the ESG um, uh, impact investment, SDG you know, projects anchored around the SDGs, um, being more transparent in the dec declaration of, of their ESG carbon, carbon footprint, et cetera, and um, more vocal about really you know, um, admitting or um, um, just saying no to greenwashing, which is so prevalent. Um, um, in, 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 in the private and business sector. So that's, I think overall, that's what excites me because I, I, I'm on both worlds, this transcending business and, and humanitarian work together. And for me to, to see that um, firsthand and, and, and you know, 
uh, advocate for the public private partnerships of the entire SDGs. I think it's very promising um, because we, we really believe that without the support and partnership of the private sector and the amount of money that they can really pour into these projects, you know, to, to crush inequality across the board, um, it, it's just not going to happen. So that's what excites me as a business person at the same time and as a humanitarian. So yeah, and then and, and we're going to keep on keep on, um, uh, I think, you know, uh, rallying on and, and, and cheerleading these, these, these companies that are doing great work in holding fellow companies and peer, fellow CEOs who, you know, holding them accountable for, 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 for more support uh, for SDGs and ESG related projects. Yes, and for us at the Colorado Health Foundation, you know, COVID, gave us an opportunity with everyone now rushing and, and wanting to get back to normal. It gave us the opportunity to highlight the fact more broadly and more succinctly that normal wasn't so great for so many of our neighbors here in Colorado. And that the work we need to do to create a future so that families have a life and a quality of life that's worth wanting to get back to, that's worth looking forward to getting back to. And so that's been, uh, you know, the uh, uh, positive thing we've been able to take out of this uh, of this pandemic. And we're just about out of time. So let me let me thank you all. Carol, thank you for allowing me to participate and facilitate this conversation with these absolutely fierce women. And um, thank you, ladies, for uh, for being so conversational and so thoughtful. Thank you. Oh. Thank you all. Thanks. Yeah, Karen, thanks for assembling everybody. And and I said this yesterday, we had a, a STEM event with some in, incredible um, um, STEM leaders. And I said, if every boardroom looked like this, if every board of a foundation looked like this, had this type of diversity, you know, our world would, if every governmental structure had this type of all these different kinds of people, different perspectives, things would look really different. And I think we're at such a moment in time right now in history where women can really stand up and ask for these big things that we need from these organizations and that the tech companies have just made billions in the last year, the big five, as things have you know, really been so different for so many others. And so how do we all use that influence like with arms locked together to be able to really hold that up for people so that we don't just keep doing some of the things that weren't really working before COVID hit us? So I just think you all are incredible and we look forward to being a vehicle with all of you to, um, to continue to raise those issues in all the ways that you are on the ground and with all the populations that you serve, as well as with people who um, might have that influence or those public private partnerships um, and be able to really look at things, make very bold and different commitments than they ever would have before COVID hit. So. So thanks so much for everybody who watched and we recorded this session and we will be sharing it tomorrow um, in the newsletter and then everybody who signed up will get the link to it. So you can also share it out with your networks and um, we look forward to seeing you all next month and hopefully at our conference, at our virtual conference this year and um, hope everybody is getting their vaccine in the next few weeks if you haven't gotten it already and um, keep wearing keep wearing those face masks out there until we're out of this time period and the variants have been figured out and we're all safe to be back to normal. So thanks for everybody and happy, happy International Month of Women and so great to share it with you guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.